Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to part four of this video series on a black repertoire for uh, D4 sidelines. Um, so in this video, here I'm put a couple moves on the board, we're going to look at uh, two moves from white. One is uh, knight c3 and the uh, lines that follow from that, that would be the uh, Jabava attack and the Richter Verisov primarily, and also the move um, g3, the uh, sort of like an attempt to get into the Catalan opening. What these two moves uh, from white have in common is that uh, they're putting more pressure on the center than we saw in the previous uh, two videos. Uh, previously, white was going for a very solid setup uh, with the idea of building some long-term kingside attack, and the response from black was to try and undermine the center with uh, c5 primarily and knight to c6. When white is playing more aggressively, though, you can't... Uh, you can't always uh, get to those uh, positions, or at least not without uh, considerable risk. So we're going to be um, playing a little more cautiously as uh, black here. So after knight c3, the move that I'm recommending is, um, well, first knight f6. So we're still going with knight f6 and d5, and then bishop to uh, f4, the Jobava attack. That's uh, what I want to look at first. I'm recommending the move e6 here, just shoring up that center. And um, the first thing you have to check in playing a move like this is uh, you have to look and see if there's some tactic involving those two pieces. So uh, white can play knight to b5 here. This is, in fact, a line. And you have to play this funny move knight to a6 to defend uh, c7. But it turns out this is um, okay for, um, for black. And this uh, sequence, the following sequence, will sort of justify our decision and holding back the c pawn because after uh, uh, white continues with e3, opening up a line for this bishop, then uh, you want to play c6 and kick that knight back. And if you had already played c5, then you wouldn't have had this option. So the knight retreats, and now um, <clears throat> you have to worry about the bishop just taking that knight off. So uh, b6 is a reasonable move here so that you can actually take back with a piece. And uh, white doesn't want to give up the bishop for the knight unless he's uh, inflicting some pawn damage. So uh, white will probably continue developing bishop to b3. And now, having met the immediate threats, you can go with bishop d6. And in the long run, you still have a plan of castling, playing bishop b7, and playing c5. You've just uh, been delayed a move because of... Uh, the way that uh, white has been playing aggressively in the center. But uh, this is a fine position for black. You have time to uh, get those moves in. Uh, white's still going to take some time to complete his development and get castled. So you should be okay here. So um, anyway, after this e6 move, that knight b5 idea is not the main uh, move from white. Uh, normally white will continue with uh, e3, just uh, directly opening up a line for his bishop and, you know, eventually wants to develop his pieces and castle kingside typically, although we did see some lines where there was uh, white castle and queenside, but that's, that's uh, less common. Anyway, in a position like this, you can immediately challenge, <clears throat> challenge the bishop on uh, f4, just like we saw with the London system. You want to get this bishop out to d6 and challenge it. And now if white plays knight to, uh, knight to b5, first of all, there's no threat on... Uh, c7, and secondly, you can trade off that bishop uh, and give white the doubled pawns. Not that the doubled pawns are such a big deal. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not recommending that you voluntarily trade, but if you're prompted to trade by a move like knight b5, then you shouldn't be afraid of it. But uh, if white continues developing normally with knight f3, uh, just leave the bishops in opposition there. Castle. Um, White continues to develop a bishop d3. He's going to castle next. And now you can get in the move c5. And so this is uh, a position where you can actually get get the knight to c6 and get that pawn to c5. And if you manage to get that pawn to c5 in one move, it just took a while longer to uh, get to that position where you were able to play that. Uh, let's see. Uh, there, was, there was one other thing um, White could try here. Uh, uh, White's being a little more adventurous instead of going with a normal developing move like bishop d3. He could also uh, try and get this knight to uh, e5. But you can still play uh, uh, pawn to c5 in this position and then later develop your knight and challenge uh, challenge his knight on e5. So that should be 
an okay position as well. So that's uh, how I recommend playing against the um, Jabava attack. There's another move after uh, after you've gone knight to f6 and uh, white has played knight to c3 on move two, which is uh, white could actually continue with knight f3. This is sort of uh, <laughs> avoiding a decision. The decision is whether to put the uh, bishop on f4, which is the uh, Jobava attack, or to put the bishop on g5, which is the uh, Richter Verasov attack. So suppose white just keeps on uh, delaying that decision for a while and continues with knight to f3. Once again, the e6 is the move I'm recommending so that if, uh, if bishop f4 is played, just go bishop d6 and we just transposed uh, directly back to that line in the, uh, in the Jabava attack. So that is fine. Um, and then if uh, white goes bishop g5, which is really the most logical move here, you've, you've now uh, pushed this pawn forward to e6, so you're sort of uh, uh, accepting that there's going to be a pin there. Uh, then you can play bishop to e7 and break the pin immediately. So this is going to be um, better for uh, black than some s lines at the Richter Verasov where uh, bishop to g5 is played earlier. We'll show that. But the fact that you break the pin immediately means that uh, e4 is not really in the picture here. That, that pawn can just be taken. It doesn't really uh, lead to a whole lot. So normally uh, white would continue with the e3 and then you can go with c5. So once again, you're getting uh, this pawn structure in. It just takes a few more moves to set it up. Um, okay, so that's the... Uh, let's go back. That's um, after knight c3, knight f6. First we looked at bishop f4, the Jobava attack. Next we looked at uh, knight f3, which is uh, kind of a waiting move. And now finally uh, bishop g5, the uh, Richter Verasov. And I have to say, in putting the repertoire together, this line <laughs> gave me the most trouble. Uh, first of all, the very first move is, is a move we haven't seen, at least not right in this position. And it's a move I've been avoiding throughout the repertoire. But it appears the best move right here is knight bd7. So in all the other lines, I've been striving to get my bishop to uh, c6, but it looks like it's just uh, not happening <laughs> against the Richter Verasov. It seems like this is really the best move, knight bd7. Um, well, there is one other idea here. You could immediately go e6, just as we saw uh, playing against the uh, Jobava attack. The downside of the immediate uh, e6 is that now there is this pin operating and uh, white can play e4. And this is not a terrible position. This is, in fact, a mainline position. This is the classical French. <laughs> so if you know the classical French, uh, then this is actually just a fine position, and you can just go ahead and play uh, e6 here, and you should be OK. Uh, the normal move order, by the way, is uh, e4, e6, d4, d5, getting the pawns out there first, then the knight to c3. That's uh, the third move, and giving black a choice between going for the win hour with bishop b5 or playing knight f6, the classical French. And then the bishop coming out is a very common response to the classical for French. So anyway, that's that's how we transpose into a classical French <laughs> from uh, from the Richter Verasov attack. And so you can get there by playing e6. Uh, and if you don't mind playing that position, I, like I said, it's a fine position, but you may not be familiar with it or comfortable with it. So I was trying to find a you know, a line against the Richter Verasov that didn't rely on that. So, and, and independently, it seems like knight bd7 really is just the best move in this position. So um, let's look at um, an aggressive attempt by white to uh, take over the center, and that's the move f3. And people who are uh, familiar with the Richter Verasov and particularly the history of it, um, this is no longer the most popular move, but uh, this was uh, the move that was played classically, and so you need to be prepared. You might run into that. Um, and I'm recommending c6 here. So kind of the theme of this video is, is playing either e6 or c6 to shore up the center. And uh, right now it's still a little uh, early to play e6 because, uh, because of the uh, e4 move, taking advantage of the pen. So c6, and now if there's... Um, this move e4, what you can do is you can play like this. You trade it off, and then you go directly for the move e5. 
So this is kind of a borrowing an idea. I was playing exactly the same way against the Black Mardemer. I was playing with, uh, with the pawn on c6 and the pawn on e5, if you remember part one of this video. And uh, this also turns out to work in this case against the uh, f3 line of the, uh, of the Richter Verisov. They're very similar uh, kinds of positions because the knight is coming out here to uh, c3 in both cases, and there's that early, uh, early e4 to, to bust up the center. So um, this is okay for black. The, um, if white takes the pawn, you can just uh, take back with the knight, allow the queen trade. Um, there's no, no particular problem there, and, and white is left with an isolated e pawn. Or if uh, white pushes the pawn forward, um, you can start uh, trading at that point, or you can ignore it for a while and just uh, develop the bishop. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's not the best square. Maybe develop it here. Uh, but the point is, when that pawn comes forward, uh, it takes the pressure off of uh, off of your e pawn. So you've got a solid setup in either case. But anyway, as I was saying, um, f3 is not the most common move there. The most common move is actually um, um, let's see. Are there any oddball moves I want to look at first? Um, there is there is uh, e3. And that's played sometimes, and you still will go e6 at this point. Once, uh, yeah, I guess I wanted to mention that idea. Once uh, white is committed to e3, instead of uh, giving up on the idea of playing e4 in a single move, then it's it's okay. You've kind of gained some time to play this e6 move, and uh, after knight f3, bishop e7, you can unpin like that, uh, and that that turns out to be okay. And then uh, so that was f3. There was e3. Oh, there was also queen d3. I'm going through all the moves aside from the main line here. And once again, e6. So it seems like e6 is, uh, is a good reply anytime uh, you're not immediately worried about the e4 move. Uh, but e4, in this particular case, you take back with the hit on the queen. Knight takes back. You defend with bishop e7. And, uh, well, white can exchange everything off here, uh, trade the knights and the bishops, uh, and leave you with a position where you have a little less space. But with those pieces traded off, uh, you should have no problem. And in fact, you have ideas of playing b6 and bishop to b7 and getting a nice bishop that way. So uh, that also is not a problem. Um, so anyway, these are these are kind of rare lines. The main move here is actually the move knight to f3. Pretty logical move, just keeping on developing. And here I want to play c6 again, just like in the uh, previous line after uh, f3. So f3 or knight f3, you can answer with this c6 move. And um, once again, if you went e6 there, probably uh, white would follow up right away with e4 and we've transposed into some kind of French defense. If you don't mind playing that position, that's okay as well, but uh, I'm trying to stay away from that for the moment. So c6, um, and now, uh, White sort of runs out of moves to play. <laughs> he needs to play uh, e3 here so that he has a square to develop his bishop to. And now after e3 is played, once again, you can go for e6, going for this solid setup. Um, let's see. And most likely, White will continue with bishop to d3. Once again, uh, well, this is kind of an interesting line. White can play e4 right away. And uh, I just wanted to point out that h6 is an interesting reply here. Um, basically, the idea is uh, if the bishop retreats, you kick it with g5, breaking the pin, and then you're just grabbing the pawn. So uh, by playing h6 here, you're forcing white to uh, take off the knight. And uh, you can take back. And then you can play a5. And you might think this is a little bit awkward. But well, white has sacrificed the bishop pair to get this position. And you have the move knight to e4. And this turns out to be a useful uh, resource as well. Um, if uh, white tries to put more pressure on the knight, you trade it off for the knight on c3. If white takes immediately, you take back with the pawn. And this knight here is actually out of good squares. Notice that the queen and the pawns are covering all of these squares. Um, and he pretty much has to go back to g8. So you actually, <laughs> although you have a funny looking pawn structure for a move or two, uh, uh, white's uh, White's way behind in development, and you have the bishop pair, so that turns out to be okay as well. Um, so probably White is not going to go 
for that uh, E3 followed by E4 idea. It just leaves them a little too far behind in development to be uh, effective. But I just wanted you to have some ideas in mind in case you see something strange like that. Um, so bishop d3, just continuing with normal development. You go with bishop e7, uh, white castles, black castles. This is just uh, normal developing moves. There's nothing nothing really uh, terrific going on here. And after this, after you've got your king out of the center, um, now you can go with c5. And so that is uh, was also an idea in some of those lines against the Jabava attack. You haven't given up on the idea of playing c5. At some point you want to... Uh, create a little space for yourself and put more pressure on white center. But you have to wait until you've sort of taken care of business in the center here, got your king to a safe square, and it's uh, safe to open up the position. And uh, and after c5, you should be able to... Uh, <clears throat> you should be fine here. Um, okay, so that completes this, uh, what I wanted to say about the uh, Jabava attack and the Richter Verisov. Let's go back and take a look at that uh, last line. Next, I wanted to look at those lines where uh, white plays the move g3. Um, so these g3 lines uh, always seem to transpose into a Catalan, and the Catalan opening is one opening I haven't actually covered in my d4, d5 opening survey, so I owe you that one. Uh, and, uh, well, so I, I guess to kind of make up for that, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the Catalan. So a normal way to get into the Catalan, one of the ways to get there is d4, d5, c4 looking like a queen's gambit, e6, and g3. And it's this pawn structure, g3, d4, and c4, that defines the Catalan. And, uh, and knight f6 is the normal move here. And white can continue, well, white does continue with knight f3 and bishop g2. And the idea of the Catalan is pretty straightforward. The bishop on g2 is going to uh, put pressure on the long diagonal, and it's uh, working in conjunction with this uh, pawn on c4, also applying pressure to the center. So it's it's a very uh, consistent system, very coherent um, uh, setup of the pieces and the pawns. And so when white plays g3 at any time, uh, this c4 move is always going to be on the agenda. Um, let's see, the Catalan opening, let's, let's give uh, two of the main lines here. Um, knight f3 is how white usually continues, although bishop g2 could be played first. And then taking. This is known as the open Catalan when, uh, when black takes immediately. Um, and the idea could be to hold on to that pawn. It's an extra pawn, and white's not taking it back because this bishop is not going to be grabbing that pawn. The bishop is going to the g2 square. So that's one justification for grabbing that. Uh, white's going to have to find a different way to round up that pawn. And then secondly, um, black can sometimes just hold on to the pawn, and so you could play on with an extra pawn, although white will have compensation. And that's that's proved to be pretty good for white in the long run. Anyway, knight f3, d takes c4, bishop g2. This is how the open Catalan might continue. If uh, black wants to hold on to the pawn, you can play a move like a6, uh, preparing b5 there. Can't play b5 too quickly, though, because... Uh, this bishop will open up with an attack on the rook, and there'll be a discovered attack on the rook with the knight move, so could get uh, dicey. But a, a few moves of preparation, say castles, uh, knight to c6, putting another piece on that diagonal, uh, e3, bishop d7, defending the knight, and uh, really preparing b5, and then uh, maybe queen e2, finally putting some pressure on that pawn and encouraging black to go ahead and defend it. So this is a position where black has got that extra pawn and is holding on to it um, and can keep it for a while. So uh, if you're a materialistically inclined player, you might enjoy playing like this. But uh, white has uh, a lot of compensation on this diagonal, and this uh, the chess engine actually rates this position as favorable for white. So I think it's uh, really pretty good, and it's not a, not a position I could really recommend <laughs> uh, if uh, without some study. So... Um, in this position, instead of uh, taking, the other way of playing is uh, known as the closed Catalan, um, and that usually involves the move bishop to e7. Uh, the particular line I'm going to show is actually slightly more popular. It's to throw in this check first. I guess the idea is this bishop uh, maybe would prefer to be on b2 rather than d2, but uh, you're, trying to, you're trying to disorder white's pieces, and then you drop back to e7. So black's bishop ends up in the same place. And this light 
might continue with bishop g2, uh, castles, castles, and c6. And I will stop it here. Uh, but white has a very solid setup. And uh, um, I, I mean, black black has a very solid setup with this uh, pawn chain here, the pawn triangle. And um, and so even if there's an exchange here on uh, on d5, you can take back with a pawn and, and keep this bishop somewhat uh, restrained. So a solid way for a black to play, um, but quite playable. And, and black gradually unwinds from this position. Um, and we'll show uh, that uh, later on uh, when we're looking at some of these uh, other other lines. So um, so that's what I wanted to say about the mainline Catalan. Let's get back to the uh, topic of this video, which is d4, d5 sidelines. Yeah, I don't consider that a sideline. I think that's a mainline opening. Um, anyway, d4, d5, g3. This is the move that's uh, a bit of a sideline. White is avoiding playing c4 and uh, and just asking, waiting to see how black is going to respond. So I'm recommending responding in the same way. Once again, knight f6 and uh, d5, the, the universal formula. So the knight comes out to f3, and now e6 is a good move in this position, and white goes bishop g2. And these two moves could have happened in either order, but um, in, in both cases, you're going to be responding with e6 first. And uh, so you're just building up this solid center here and just waiting for uh, for white to make a commitment. And uh, whenever c4 is happening, then you're going to respond with uh, c6. So white can continue uh, avoiding <clears throat> those moves. Well, let's see, yeah, white just went beach, bishop to g2. You go bishop to e7 here. I think it's better in this case, in this particular move order, it's better to go to e7 directly rather than throwing in the check. In this case, uh, white might block the check with um, with c3 because white has not yet committed this pawn to c5 in the in the mainline Catalan. This pawn is already on c5 when you deliver the check. So, um, so I think just putting the bishop directly on e7 is fine. Uh, white can castle here um, or throw in c4. You castle and then finally uh, white has run out of useful moves and uh, throws in the move c4. You go c6. And uh, yeah, this is a position uh, that I left off in the uh, mainline Catalan as well. So having having arrived here uh, via a sideline, say queen c2, it's a logical follow-up. Just wanted to give some idea of the plan for black at this point. You always have the idea, first of all, of trading off. So just take that uh, pawn at some point and uh, and white will have to retake, and maybe that's not the best square for that piece. Um, you can throw in knight b to d7 first and then take so that the knight will come to b6 with tempo. So that's one plan. Another idea is uh, is kind of a slow build-up plan. You can try things like b6 um, and bishop to b7, getting some opposition along this uh, long diagonal, and then go for um, go for the uh, the c5 move. So eventually you can try and open that up after you've got a, uh, a properly uh, defended bishop there. Well, actually, it doesn't have to be defended necessarily. You have to be aware of tactics along the diagonal, so you have to play a little bit carefully. But that can be a plan, too, just to uh, push b6, bishop b7, and play for, uh, for uh, c5. And perhaps after c5, you can get a knight c6, or sometimes you need to play knight to d7 first to allow that. But anyway, those are two different plans you can have from this position and uh, should be okay for black. Okay, so that concludes all of the lines I wanted to talk about in this series, and that finishes this video. I'm going to do one more video in this series where I want to give some uh, example games, and uh, that will be it. So I will see you then.